Okay, my name's uh, Bill Hoffman, and I'm going to be talking about CMake and some progress with uh, C++ 20 modules. So, quick, uh, quick introduction to, to Kitware. We're a uh, open source build company. We've been around. I'm one of the founders. We've been around since 1998, and we've uh, there were five of us that started it. There's about a couple hundred now. We have an office in France. And we have divisions that work in computer vision, data analytics, scientific computing, medical computing, and software solutions. Um, we create platforms, a lot of open source platforms, and build our company around that. So where did this CMake thing come from and how did we get involved with it? Well, one of our early projects we had was with the Insight Segmentation and Registration Toolkit. This was funded by the uh, National Library of Medicine, um, part of the Visible Human Project. Has anyone in the audience heard of the Visible Human Project? No hands. Okay. Um, yeah, I got, I got a couple of hands. Okay. So basically, this is a project where they took a, a body that was donated to science, a male and a female, and they CT'd and MR'd them after they died, and then they froze them solid and sliced them as soon as they could and took pictures. Um, so they had ground truth data. And then they put that data out as open source, essentially, but then realized that really what they needed was the code, because really that's what counts today, right? Um, you know, the grad students would go in and the, the professor would read a paper and say, you know, hey, check out this algorithm. You know, does it work? This segmentation algorithm work? And the grad student would disappear for three months, come back and say, nah, it didn't work. It's like, well, you know, the professor was like, is the, the paper wrong? Is there, there's so many things that could have gone wrong there. But if the code is actually solidified and written there, they, then you would know it worked. So they decided they would make a C++ library um, called ITK. And Kitware was, there were three companies and three universities involved with this project. Kitware was one of the uh, engineering companies. And we were essentially just tasked with making it build on Unix, Mac, and Windows. Um, I had been playing around with auto tools and other things for, for many years when I worked at GE Research and Development. And I really didn't see a tool at that point in time. And I said, we need to create something. And that, that's essentially how CMake was born. Um, and I remember talking to the uh, ITK group at the National Library of Medicine. And it was a kind of a big room. And one of the guys like, Bill, why are you trying to create a new build system for ITK? It'll be this weird thing for ITK. And before he let me talk, he was like, wait a minute, you're not talking about creating a build system for ITK. You're trying to create one for all of C++. And that was uh, really what I was after. Um, and I, I saw a talk by David Abrahams many, many years ago um, where Boost aimed to give C++ a useful set of libraries. He had some slide with Java with a whole bunch of useful stuff and Python and C Sharp. And he goes, at that time, you know, C++ comes with IO stream library. Yay. Um, so things, and CMake aims to give that compile time portability. We can't compile it once and run everywhere, but we should be able to compile the same code everywhere using the same specification, that CMake list file. Um, and also make it easy to mix both large and small libraries, big projects, right? Remember this came from research. So we had this ITK project where this, we wanted the students to be able to quickly access this large, what turned out to be a you know, million line code library, and we needed, and that was really hard to do 20 years ago. I mean, to write a cross-platform piece of code that actually built across different platforms. It just didn't exist. Um, but it's actually been a big community effort. Um, there's uh, you know, 900 or so more contributors According to uh, GitHub, um, there's excellent books about CMake, not written by me. Um, so there's a thriving community. Um, and also Kitware gets support. People come to us to work on it. We've been working with Bloomberg Engineering. Um, we've improved some XCOF support in CMake, um, improved CMake's file base API to include more information about installed components. And they're helping to uh, fund the C++ modules which is in progress, and I promise I'll get to some good stuff about modules pretty soon. Um, some unlikely but cool contributors, uh, Minecraft um, adopted CMake as their build system. They're now owned by Microsoft. 
Um, they've actually uh, contributed the CMake presets. Has anybody used CMake presets? There we go, we got a few hands. You can thank Minecraft for that. You know, so it's <laughs> Interesting, uh, that was always great. My kids like to hear that Minecraft is used by CMake. Or CMake used Minecraft. Um, Visual Studio now ships CMake. Um, CMake's really becoming part of the community, part of that development environment. Um, I always liked a kid that uh, when I started this and was reverse engineering Visual Studio project files to get them to generate with CMake, um, that Microsoft probably would have sued me for reverse engineering their code and shut me down. And uh, they're like, no, no, we wouldn't have done that. I'm like, you know, 20 years ago, maybe you would have. Um, but it's great to work with them now. And uh, they've been uh, working really hard with the C++ module work and working with Kitware to, to help them enhance CMake. And they've been contributing stuff back into CMake as well. Um, so CMake adapts to new technologies so the developers don't have to. I think this is one of the key selling points of CMake. So as a new IDE or a compiler comes out, the latest thing, if your code's already set up with CMake, it should be relatively easy to get it to work in this new environment. I think the uh, Ninja command line build tool from Google um, was a great example of this, right? Google needed to, didn't like make, it was, it was slow, it had issues. They wrote this new tool called Ninja. And I think within a month, maybe three months of when they announced it and made it open source, it was available to CMake. And then everybody that was using CMake suddenly got faster builds and more parallelism in their builds. Um, as new compilers com come out, GCC versions, Clang, um, when Apple Silicon came out, if your project was already set up with CMake, it was more primed to work on those new environments. Um, CMake, uh, JetBrains does a uh, survey. I think we're up to 53%. Um, there's lots of job openings requiring CMake, so it's, it's definitely becoming part of the community. Um, Qt decided to deprecate the QBS build system and adopt CMake. We get about a CMake download every six seconds, I think, we tried to figure out. Um, and then, of course, there was in uh, C++ Now, where uh, Bryce said that, you want a standard C++ build system? You've got one. It's called CMake. Resistance is futile. Use CMake. So why is it popular? Why did it catch on? Um, it does a lot with a little. Um, a simple add library call, right? What's going on behind there is a lot. Right, it's, it's building shared libraries, static libraries. Um, it's supporting different compilers, many architectures, and a lot of stuff going on behind there, behind an executable, behind a test. There's a lot of things that the developers of the code really don't need to worry about and don't have to worry about anymore. Um, the basic CMake workflow is to run CMake. That builds a build tree, and then you can go to your native build tool. Um, so you can, or you can run CMake minus minus build, um, you can run CMake through a uh, graphical user interface that's got built with Qt. Um, there's CCMake, which is a terminal uh, command line interface. And then, of course, you can run it non-interactively. Um, essentially, CMake reads the uh, CMake cache file, um, reads the CMake list files. You can iterate around because you might want to add turn on options, turn off options. That can add more options. Um, but once you've built your uh, build system, you can sort of forget CMake is ever around and then just continue to build in your native environment. That was another goal of CMake to only really have small amount of dependencies. I want, it depends on the C++ compiler. If you're building C++, you're going to need one of those. It, and that is about it, really, to get, to get CMake going. And then it uses the native tools. So. If your developers like using Visual Studio, they can use Visual Studio. If some of the developers like to use Ninja on the command line, they can use that. If there are old people like me and they like to use you know, Emacs and Ninja on the command line on Windows with Visual Studio, they can do that too. Um, it allows you to have, or the project to have, the best use of the most expensive resource, which is the developers. And developers have various different environments they like, and CMake doesn't force any one person into a particular environment. CMake has changed along the way. Um, what's been known as uh, modern CMake now, which is uh, target-centric CMake. 
essentially targets, libraries, um, should supply all the include flags, all the minus D flags, all the compiler options that go with that library. And then the only thing you need to do is link with that library and the rest of the code will work. And another point is that there should be no difference between external and internal targets. So if I find a pre-built library on a system, I should be able to pull it into my CMake build system and have it treated as if it was built locally. So modern CMake has an executable that depends on a library and those libraries can depend on other libraries. Older CMake depended on the directory structure, much like an older make system would have, and everything sort of filtered down. There's still some old commands in CMake, like include directories, which would go down below into each subdirectory. Those are discouraged and not needed anymore. The usage requirements, you can give a private interface or public. Um, only the given target will use it if it's private. Only consumer and targets use it if it's interface. Um, private plus interface. Um, you can specify um, dollar angle bracket build interface, and that's um, a generator expression that's used by consumers of the project using the build directory. And then you can use install interface, which is used by consumers after this target has been installed. So if we look at this uh, little example here, we can see that uh, we've got a trunk that depends on root, and then leaf depends on trunk, and then we can see the compile line links in lib root. Um, if we change um, root to be private, you can see when it does the link that root no longer shows up in the link line. Um, some interesting uh, things we added, uh, jumbo builds, controlling the group size with CMake Unity batch build size. Um, of course, with CXX modules, um, it might reduce the uh, usage of this utility. Um, presets allow common configuration flags, variables, and build directory generator for a project to be stored in a JSON file. CMake presets.json is version controlled for sharing between users. The CMake user presets JSON is not version controlled and is for local machine specific use. Um, a simple example here, um, we've got a preset that says uh, the, called name ninja debug. The generator uses an ninja generator and it's saying I want my binary directory to be underneath the source directory called build slash debug. And I want my CMake build type to be debug. And I can select this through the GUI and then have all that happen for me. Um, CMake does support uh, pre-compiled headers. So you can say add a library, target pre-compiled headers with an interface leaf. Um, CMake, uh, this is a new uh, feature through environment variables. You can uh, set the uh, CMake CXX compiler launcher to make it easier to uh, build with something like CCache. CMake also includes a full platform install, cross-platform install system, so you can specify the uh, rules to run at install time, can install targets, files, or directories, provide default locations. Um, packaging, once a uh, dark art um, or a simple CMake command. I remember early on with CMake, there was, uh, I think we were using like a Wix installer, there was one computer at Kitware that had the Wix installer on it, and there was one guy at Kitware that knew how to use the installer and set it up. So if he wasn't there or something was wrong with that computer, we couldn't do a release. Um, so we created CPAC, which was bundled with CMake. Um, it creates installers. Um, you can do Mac drag and drop installers. Um, you can create Windows installers. And essentially, uh, you know, it supports just a few things like targz files, um, Wix installers, Nullsoft installer, um, drag and drop, or the package manager, Debian packages, or RPM. Um, using it on Windows, you install the uh, command line zip or your installer. You set up your project to work with CPAC. The essential way to do this is to get your install working. Um, once the install commands work, and they can go into a relocatable directory, and your executables and libraries can work from a relative path. So there's some coding has to happen there. 
Um, then you just include the uh, CPAC module and it will set up uh, what you need to do to use CPAC. Um, testing with CMake, we've got built-in testing because testing is obviously important. Um, testing needs to be enabled um, with include uh, ctest or enable testing command. You call add test, you give it a name and a command. The executable should return zero for a test that passes. Um, ctest and executable is tribute CMake can use to run the tests. You can also set up uh, regular expressions to, if you don't want to depend on the output of the command. Um, running ctest, you just run it in a build directory. It'll run all the tests in your project. Um, you can give it a minus J option to run the tests in parallel. Uh, minus R option to choose which ones. Um, you can give it verbosity. Tell it to rerun just the failed test. And there's obviously help to give you help. Um, we've got Google test integration um, and a mode um, as of CMake 310 that ctest will discover um, after it's built what tests are in there and allow you to uh, run the individual uh, G-tests through, through C-tests. Um, C-tests and multi-core tests, you can set the processor affinity. So if you're going to say you've got an MPI program and you're running that with testing and it's using up four CPUs, you don't want the minus J thing with the test to uh, overwhelm your CPU usage. So you can tell it that this test is going to use more CPUs than just one. Um, we've also got an open source project called C-dash that we use uh, to uh, see how the tests are running. Um, and we run CMake on a variety of platforms every night. We can drill down through this. It's another open source project. Um, OK, now C++ modules. So when C++ modules came, the CMake team at Kitware has been fretting and very afraid um, because we knew what was behind this. Um, so let's, let's take a simple example. We've got a a b.cpp that exports a module b um, and this function b. We've got a.cpp, um, which is module a, but it imports module b. And it's got a little function a that calls b. So if I just go on my command line and run a C++ compiler um, and give it a.c, I get an error because it can't find module b. Um, but if I happen to build them in the right order, if I build B first and then I build A, everything works fine. So this is a fundamental change in C++. Um, you used to be able to you know, just do C++ star.cxx and it's going to work. It's going to compile all those files. Now suddenly, it, you need to know who provides what and who consumes what, and you need to build that graph at build time. You can't, so it gets very complicated. Um, and what, what gets created, what's happening is essentially like header files, because you don't need to write the header files anymore, right? Because now you just declare I'm a module and I export this stuff, no problem. What happens there is when the compiler runs across that, it creates a build module interface, built module interface. And um, so for MSC, um, Visual Studio, it's a .ifc file. For G++, it's .gcm file. Um, you can look up the standards if you want to look into it a little more. So why were the CMake developers terrified by this, that they were adding this to C++? Well, for about 16 years, CMake has had to deal with this with Fortran. Um, so in uh, 2005, the initial makefile support for modules was added to CMake. Um, and we added support for Ninja in 2015 for Fortran Depths. Um, this was funded by the Trilinos project, and it caused us to fork Ninja, which lasted about four years because the Ninja developers were moderately interested in, in our work to get dynamic dependencies, but really didn't see the relevance to any of their code bases. Um, but suddenly in uh, 2019, we put the fear of C++ modules in them, and they actually started uh, working on con working that into it. So now Ninja actually supports dynamic dependencies. So we're, we're kind of lucky that we, we had this uh, background in Fortran. Um, so if you look at uh, the uh, Ninja um, reference, it's called Dynedef, or dynamic dependencies. 
Some use cases require implicit dependency information to be dynamically discovered from a source file content during the build in order to build correctly on the first run. So Fortran module dependencies. This is unlike header dependencies, which are only needed on the second run or later to rebuild correctly. So you can do it as sort of, so before you could sort of build your dependencies as a side effect of your build. You didn't have to scan the files first, but now you're gonna have to scan the files first. So how does CMake do this with Fortran? Well, we needed a Fortran parser. So we pulled this thing, uh, we found an open source thing called MakeDep F90 um, because some Fortran projects were using that. Other Fortran projects had the habit of basically you just type make, you get some errors, you type make again, you get some errors. You keep typing make, you know, and do that five or six times, and eventually all the modules are there and everything can build. And that's how a lot of engineers were living with Fortran modules um, until CMake started supporting it, and that was a, a big selling point for CMake. And I remember going to talking to C++ folks, and say, you know, we support Fortran modules, and they'd be like, yeah, so what? Um, now um, it's real important for CMake. Um, the patches have made it upstream in a Ninja. The dynamic dependency collator is inside CMake. Um, but CMake developers are not gonna do it alone. From our Fortran experience, modules require parsing Fortran code. C++ modules will require parsing C++ code. We're not gonna hack it with some quick regular expressions. It's just gonna be full of errors. It's, it's just not gonna work. So we need help from the compilers and we need to work with the standards committees to get this done. So in uh, February of uh, 2019, um, some folks at Kitware, uh, Ben Bakel and uh, Brad King, um, myself, we uh, worked on a paper um, describing how CMake does Fortran modules um, and got it into the tooling working group. Um, so how does that work? Um, so if we look at a simple Fortran bit of code here, we've got module math. Um, so when I compile this uh, module up on the top, it produces math.o and math.mod. Um, I've got my main here, and this main.o needs math.mod. So the way we do it is we've got all these Fortran files, and we pre-process them, and then we scan them for their dynamic dependency information. So provides and requires. Who provides modules? Who requires modules? We collate that um, across the library. And then we tell, and then we can build our build graph and we know what order things need to be built in. So we know we can compile this, this one and that will create the uh, math.mod and then we can get along, get to compiling the next piece of code. Um, and in multiple targets, it's, it's the same thing. Um, we're gonna collate, and then we're gonna build each one, and then we're gonna make sure that, essentially you have to lose a little bit of parallelism here because you have to make sure, you know, if you're using modules that are produced out of another library, that, that library's gotta be done first. Um, so, the next thing, so we know we need it from the compilers. Um, I think we've got the tooling group pretty convinced that they need to help us out here. So the next thing we're gonna do is create a file format. So um, Ben and Brad um, created a uh, paper, um, which is uh, up here, um, and that defines a JSON file format for the compilers to create that has the dependency information. So where are we today? So Visual Studio 2020 preview, 2022 preview has module scanning support exactly as described in the paper, and it works very well. Um, and GCC has a patch for name modules, um, which you can find on uh, Ben Bakel's uh, GitHub account, Math Stuff. Um, and CMake has the module work is now in CMake Master. Um, so if we look in uh, Visual Studio 2022, it's got uh, scan dependencies options, which will list the uh, module dependencies in the standard form. So let's go back to our uh, a.cpp, and if we run scan dependencies on it, 
you can see here it produces this beautiful bit of uh, JSON there, um, which says our primary output is a.object, and it outputs uh, this a.afc, which is the built binary interface, um, and we've got our logical name, um, and then it requires the logical name B, so it requires this other module. And then if we run the same thing on our B CPP, we're gonna see that um, it provides the logical name B. So you can see how you can connect those two up, and we know that to build A, we're gonna need B to be compiled. So if we do the same thing, we can uh, see the same thing with uh, G++ in modules. Um, same thing with... So basic support for named modules is there for Visual Studio and a patch G++. Um, now I'm gonna take a quick digression into a new feature in CMake. Um, it'll become apparent why, um, and this is how we implemented C++ modules partially is the file set. So this adds a file, to a, a file set to a target or adds files to an existing file set. Um, targets have zero or more named file sets. Each file set has a name, a type, a scope of interface, public or private. Um, the only acceptable type is headers. Um, so installing header on libraries before file set so let's, let's look at uh, Eigen, a little example here um, with a header-only library. We uh, create the library, Eigen interface. We've got this list of headers in it. Um, we've got a target include directories, and you can see I'm using that dollar build interface um, generator expression. So when I'm building and it's in my, my build tree, it's CMake current source to source. Um, but in my stall tree, it's include slash Eigen. And then I've got install commands that give the various things, and I'm installing these different files. But with the file set, I can say target source is eigen, file set headers, um, baster is source, I list my files, and then I can just install it um, without using any generator expressions or anything like that, and I have uh, a much more elegant installation with file set. Um, so when I run the install, you can see that it does the right thing. Um, so let's go back to a.cxx and b.cxx with the file set. Um, so now with C++ modules, the only acceptable types are headers and CXX modules. So if we compile um, a.cpp and b.cpp with CMake, the way we do that, we create a, a simple library and called simple, and we add a file set, CXX modules, type CXX modules, and we list the two uh, source files. And then we uh, can build it with Ninja, and you can see that uh, it compiles and everything works. Um, if we look at it with, uh, well, that's running CMake, you can see the build files have been built. And then we uh, run Ninja um, with the verbose mode, and you can see what's going on here, that it's, it's first scanning the dependencies of the two files, um, and then um, running the, uh, the collation step, and then actually doing the build in the correct order so that everything works. And the same thing works with G++. So essentially we've got uh, per target scanning. What happens here, we've got our, a, our CPP files, they get scanned and they create the uh, .ddi files. And then those are collated together. The scan is done by the compiler, i.e. CL scan dependencies. And the collation is done by CMake. Um, CMake minus E, CMake ninja dine depth. So the whole process here, right? So when CMake's running, that creates the rules.ninja, the build.ninja, a cxx depends.json file, there's one per target. 
And then we run the Ninja process, and then that's gonna cause the compiler to run a scan per translation unit. And then there's gonna be a per translation unit .ddi file, which is the JSON file from P1689R5. Um, and then CMake minus E, CMake Ninja Dine Depths is gonna run per target, which is gonna create a cxx.dd file, which is a Ninja Dine Depth file, and a translation unit.modmap, which is passed to the compiler for each translation unit. Um, and then a CXX modules.json, which is a CMake readable version of the CXX DD file, as opposed to readable by Ninja. And then finally, the compiler gets run um, per translation unit in the correct order based on the dynamic dependencies. And then you get your .os, your .libs, your .exes, and all the stuff you're used to. So named modules. Um, a module unit um, little, is a translation unit that creates a module declaration. A named module is a collection of module units with the same module name. Um, module interface unit is a module unit whose module declaration starts with an export keyword. Any other module unit is a module implementation unit. A module partition is a module unit whose module declaration contains a module partition. Um, so I, I looked this up on the, the standard. Um, I actually don't do it ton of coding lately, but I've actually been getting into the C++ module stuff, um, sort of take off my pointy-haired boss hat, um, and it's been kind of fun. Um, so I looked up the standard here, and it had a small example, and I coded it up and tried it in CMake myself. Um, so I created this uh, CMake list file. Um, I put those different uh, translation units here. Um, we've got a, the uh, Essentially, a, a translation unit one, which has the primary uh, module interface. Translation two is a module partition file. And then I uh, sort of threw it in. And I did a build, and we got an error because it's saying that uh, t4.cxx is of type CXX modules but does not provide a module. So you get a nice diagnostic there. Essentially, the fix is to uh, move our t4.cxx into just a regular uh, source file and not put it in the CXX module file set. Um, and there was some discussion with, uh, when this came out because Visual Studio, um, since they'd been working on modules ahead of everyone, I think they got a little bit ahead of the standard and they had module partitions a slight different interpretation, um, which will probably be a Microsoft-specific thing that goes on, but they, by default, were going to the non-standard um, approach, which was gonna make CMake go through a lot of extra hoops, and we actually had a module partition file set in there briefly, um, but we were able to uh, work with uh, Gabby and actually get a workaround for this and come up with a resolution where everyone was happy and Microsoft could have their internal, stuff, internal way of doing it and then have the dependency scanning um, work correctly. So that was a, a big win and, another, and a reason I come out and do talks like this and, and you know, CMake, we can't do it on our own. You know, it's not, it's not 20 years ago where I can reverse engineer Visual Studio or, or whatever's going on. It really needs the whole community to pull together to get this, this moving forward. You know, to get C++ modules to where everybody in this room can just type a few lines and get it to work. You know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done there and needs to be done as a community. Um, so if I go in here, I can see it works with, uh, with Ninja. I get my build. Works with Visual Studio. Great, we're cross-platform. Um, I can split it into two libraries. I can run Ninja. That, that works as well. Um, at Kitware, we also, to get our heads around this, created our own module examples um, with a main that consumes the modules, our, a module interface unit, a module implementation unit, and module parti partition re-exported by the, the main module, a module implementation unit implementing the partition, and an internal module partition. Um, so here's our main calling these uh, various functions. And it just does import my module. 
Um, inside here, I'm saying that I'm uh, exporting um, my module. Um, you can see I'm doing export import this partition. So I'm exporting that partition of the module into the public interface of this module. I'm importing uh, an internal module partition. So I can call internal functions, but they don't end up in my interface. Um, I've got a module implementation. So this implements a function declared within the module. Um, implement a function declared in the module partition. And I'm saying this is all in my module. Um, in the module partition, I'm exporting a uh, function from this partition and implementing it here. And I'm exporting a couple uh, functions from this module partition, and they're going to be implemented elsewhere in another file. Um, in this uh, my module implementation, implements this uh, function. Um, we're defining a function used elsewhere in the module implementation. This is not exported from the module, but it's used inside of it. Um, so we've got our CMake code here, where we've got a module implementation. Essentially, the, the files that aren't generating any modules or exporting modules end up in the uh, just regular list of sources under there under private. And then our file set for CXX modules lists the things that are creating these modules or exporting modules. Um, we can install and export with CMake. Um, with modules. Um, so you see inside here we're exporting, um, installing the file set CXX modules. Um, we're giving it a destination. Um, and essentially, this is a, a nice way of uh, creating it so that CMake can export these modules and then someone else could come consume them. Um, we can run CMake. Um, this is a new feature in CMake that you can, on the command line, set the install prefix um, with a nice command line option instead of minus D. Um, so we're running that. We're running ninja install. You can see it. Uh, it's installing our library, and then it's installing the, uh, the public source code um, because that might have to be used to build binary module interfaces um, by a consumer. Um, and it's creating uh, CMake importable targets through the .CMake files. And it's also uh, installing the uh, binary built uh, module interfaces, the .gcm files. This one's on uh, a Linux-based system. Um, and we can do the same thing um, and see it running on uh, Windows as well. So hey, you, you watch this talk and you're like, wow, this is kind of cool. I'd like to play around with CMake modules. Um, you want to kick the tires? Um, so how do you get? So the build, build CMake master. Um, look at there's some docs um, in there, help dev experimental. Um, grab a version of uh, Microsoft Visual Studio 2022 preview um, or build a patch GCC, um, which you can get from here. Set up your CMake list file. Um, so here, we've got a, a couple things here. We're uh, through a long history of getting burnt by a uh, People just sort of quickly shoving stuff into CMake and, and us having to support it forever. We're very wary of uh, new features. Um, so essentially, you have to set this environment variable with a GUID saying that uh, you, you want to use the uh, CMake experimental CXX module uh, API and give it that GUID. Um, and then you also need to uh, include the uh, information that tells CMake how to run the uh, scan part for Visual Studio or GCC. Um, and obviously, you want to set your CXX standard to be C20. Um, this is another fun thing. I just got a Mac uh, myself. I wanted to try out the whole M1 experience. Um, and I also figured since it was a new platform, people might run into issues. And uh, it would be fun for me to play around with. And for whatever reason, I grabbed it. Um, and then I went, I'm like, great, I'll try the uh, Ben's patch. I grabbed GCC and tried his patch compiler and it ran into, you know, this um, architecture is not supported to build GCC. Oh, crap. Um, so I found a uh, ARM-based uh, GCC and miraculously, uh, Ben's patch applied with no conflicts on top of that patch. So whew, I got lucky. 
Um, so if anybody wants to play around on a Mac with this, you can build GCC and play around with it. Um, you can grab Ben's patch off of GitHub and that will apply cleanly. Then you can build a GCC, set your CXX CC environments before running CMake and off you go. Um, so inside a, uh, so what is this? Yeah, this is uh, for GCC. This is essentially the code you'll need to write. Um, you need to set that uh, API key to unlock the magic uh, C++ module support in CMake. And then you also need to uh, essentially tell uh, CMake that you need to run the compiler, um, except now you, this is how you run the dynamic dependency information. So this is the one for GCC. And then for Visual Studio, you can see here it's running that scan dependencies command, um, but it's also you know, doing the rest of the build. So uh, I threw up a simple example in playing with this. Um, so another thing, if you want to look at it, um, C++ 20 modules in CMake, there's a uh, complete test suite um, that Ben Bakel's created a really awesome test suite. Um, and again, if you want to turn that on, you have to do another GUID for the uh, test CXX modules. Um, you set that, you run CMake, um, and you set the uh, test compilation. You want to say name, shared, partitions, internal, partitions, export BMI, install BMI. And then I want to pass in my uh, test module compilation rules. And essentially, that's one of those files that you just saw before. Um, either for Visual Studio or GCC, and it sets those GUIDs. And then uh, you want to set the uh, test host CMake on, and then you give your normal source and path. Um, there's a test in there available as run CMake CXX modules. You can do ctest minus R to run them, um, and it lives in there. And then there's a test run CMake examples, and you can browse around in there and play with those once you get it to work with your compiler. So where are we? Um, the experimental codes in CMake Master. Visual Studio works with 2020 Preview. GCC works with the patch. Clang does not yet provide the uh, P16A9 dependency scanning. If anybody's looking for a fun thing to do in their spare time or wants to hack on something, there's any students here that want to make a name for themselves in CMake module land, um, we need to, to get that done. There, there are a few issues. There's, there's a couple people looking at it. Um, header units are stubbed out, but not yet working due to lack of support from the compilers. Um, we're kind of focusing, focusing on the, uh, the uh, named modules right now instead of the header modules. Frankly, header modules scare me even more than modules. Um, it's sort of like having your cake and eat it too. Let's just turn all of our include files into magic modules. Um, anyways. <laughs> so. Um, Modules are coming, as uh, Bryce said, but uh, modules are almost here, I guess I'm saying. Um, and I'm also saying modules are a team effort. Um, thanks to everyone involved, you know, um, we're, we're getting there. Some other cool new CMake features, um, like I said, you can run a CMake minus minus install prefix. Um, you can minus minus tool chain file. Um, you can do some cool debug find call stuff now. Um, depth files and all generators, which basically means custom commands now can provide their own dependencies and scanning um, like you could with uh, a regular language like C++ that we've got built in or C. Um, the CMake build type and CMake configuration types have environment variables that set defaults. Um, support for uh, system include directories um, with MSVC external um, CTest C gained environment modification test property, so you can modify the environment. HIP language support, CUDA language support continues to be improved. Um, Visual Studio.net, um, C++ C Sharp projects are uh, in there. Um, Visual Studio NuGet package restoration, CMake build. Um, the CMake guides, we're working on improving the documentation in CMake all the time. I know that's one of the things we used to constantly get beat up on, but Hey, who doesn't get beat up on for not having good documentation? Um, 
Um, we're trying to add more tutorials. Um, we're, we're constantly cleaning this up. And we've got some great contributors and collaborators helping us with that. Um, one thing we did that, that I really pushed on with the, with the team was to make sure that we could test the code because we had written these sort of nice uh, tutorial, but it would get out of date and you'd give a, a CMake training class and they would run through the tutorial and the, the code wouldn't work for all the people in the class because CMake changed or the compiler changed or it's got warnings. So essentially we came up with a way of using the uh, markup to reference back to actual code that's getting tested every night. Um, and then it produces very nice uh, documentation, but it's still referencing active code that's getting tested every night. Um, we took the mastering CMake, we open sourced it. Um, we're still working on cleaning that up. We, we've got some uh, funding to work on that, but just uh, not a lot of cycles. We're, we're pretty busy now uh, trying to do a lot of other work. Um, but we are working on getting our documentation completely out there in the open. Um, so as long as we're musing about the future, I saw the uh, keynote speaker this morning. Um, things I would like to see that all the C++ compilers provide the build system interface to collect C++ 20 modules, dependency information. Um, and I'd like to see a cross-platform standard for the information found in CMake config files. So what, what this is saying is essentially that package manager dream, you know, can we at least come up with a format that describes a C++ library on disk after it's been built. And package managers can consume that, build systems can consume it, but it's a standard format. You know, a JSON file, something standard. You know, we're writing CMake files right now, but I, I think a, a better way to do that would be just a, a standard thing that everyone can use. Um, yeah, I saw, you know, in the, the talks this morning, we all want modules and we want package managers. Um, so look for modules, try to help out, join the help. Like I said, we're not doing this alone. Um, and basically, thanks, and I can turn over to questions now. Um, if you need to reach me, build.hoffman at kitware.com. Um, if you're interested in how to write a CMake build system, um, explore the documentation. And uh, that's it, I'll turn it over to questions at this point. Uh, is there any uh, data or numbers about how much uh, build speed we could achieve with C++ modules? So, aware of? so the question is, is there any data or information about how much uh, modules are actually going to improve build times? I don't think there's a, a lot of solid information out there about that, and I'm not 100% convinced that they're going to improve build times all the time. Um, but they are bringing a, a lot of uh, other things to the uh, C++, right? You're, you're getting rid of a lot of uh, leaky sort of preprocessory stuff, right? So there, there's a lot of advantages besides just the speed. Um, there could be, in some cases, massive speeds up depending on how the library looks and how many times, basically you have to ask yourself, how many times is that code going through the preprocessor, right? And if, and if, it's, if the answer is hundreds, then modules are gonna be a huge improvement. If it's, you know, each translation unit sort of sees basically the same different things, then it's probably not gonna be as big a, a hit. But it does have other uh, features, and I do think it is the future. You know, in another 20 years, it'll all be modules, and you know, the pound include thing will be a thing of the past, and it'll be the thing your, your grandfather did. <laughs> yeah, next question. So this is like two questions. Number one is, does it respect the verbose environment variable to show what compiler you're querying for the module information? And then does it support lists uh, that expand to the correct um, separator for objects in that list when you're using and passing uh, variables to that compiler? Um, can you uh, describe a little bit further what you mean by the uh who, who's getting what list? Okay, so there's, there's a verbose environment variable that allows CMake to emit all of the invocations to compilers. Um, but I noticed recently that it doesn't work for like try run or try compile. And so I had to add um, 
additional variables to get the compiler information out to see what was going wrong. And I discovered that I had a list variable that was expanding to semicolons, which of course the compiler doesn't understand. Um, and I was just wondering how is this gonna translate to modules if I need to de debug, if I've got multiple compilers installed, which compiler is it inspecting for module information? Okay, I think that the question is how will you debug this if something goes awry and you wanna see the actual compile line that's being invoked? Um, and as you can, the, the answer to that would be, as you see in my talk, um, the verbose, um, like when I did Ninja verbose, it's actually showing each compile line and everything we're asking the compiler to do in the scanning steps. So it will be completely there. Unlike the, the try runs and try compiles are run as a completely isolated build and not part of the main build system. So that, that would have to be handled separately. But, but inside just building a main project, you will be able to see everything that we're asking the compiler to do um, and, and see where CMake's invoking. So if you look back at some of my slides later, you'll see uh, it running you know, scan dependencies through the Microsoft compiler and then running CMake to collate them. And then it shows all the individual steps in between there, so. Thank you. Sure. Yep, I have, uh, a, um, we have a question from online, I believe. Question for Chris Araman. Is there any consideration for CMake presets to support Jason 5 or YAML in order to allow inline comments? The question is, is there any uh, work to uh, have uh, CMake presets use JSON 5 so they can have inline comments? Um, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, not that I'm aware of, we are actually looking at switching JSON libraries that we're using um, because we needed better error checking and uh, JSON CPP, the library we're using, um, didn't allow us to, like, so if you had an error somewhere inside your, your JSON code, we couldn't actually tell you what line the error was on. Um, if we parsed something wrong, there was no way to get that information. We tried to contribute some stuff upstream, but the developer was has taken like six weeks or something to, to look at the stuff. So we're moving on, I think, to another JSON library. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but that would be perhaps a good thing to bring up on the uh, CMake uh, discourse list, and then we could uh, move it forward with that. It sounds like a good idea. Uh, there's another question from James Ballard. Besides docs, are there any tools to migrate existing build systems to CMake. Uh, besides, what was the first thing? Oh, besides docs, documentation. Oh, okay. So the, the question is, are there any tools besides just reading the documentation and doing it yourself to migrate from some build system to CMake? The answer is probably not. <laughs> um, there's a few tools, but mostly they were sort of one-off things. Um, I remember like one of the big movements in CMake, one of the big adoptions was when KDE adopted CMake um, and they moved from their bake file system in CMake and I think they wrote some, some scripts to do that that got them you know, like 90% of the way um, and then they went off. But you wouldn't wanna like pick up those things today because they generate 15 year old CMake code which you certainly wouldn't want. Um, so CMake is a moving target and the older build systems or other build systems are certainly moving targets as well. So I think you're sort of uh, on your own. I think we have a question on the floor. Yes, uh, you were showing all the examples with the Ninja generator. Uh, is the current module work supported by other CMake generators as well? The question is, um, are other generators besides the Ninja generator supported for modules? Um, right now it is Ninja and um, the Visual Studio IDE can handle them. Um, so we, ha we haven't done make files yet. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, seems like we might be out of questions. So thank you very much for your attention and look forward to uh, seeing you around.